With this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio, we officially begin our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1196 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Amateur Radio Digital Communications continues giving grants to amateur radio projects all around the world. We will have the latest on who received the latest grant releases. A team of amateurs in Centralia, Washington activate in the wake of a local bombing. Amateur operation in the 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz segment must cease operation by April 14, 2022. China is expanding its South China Sea antenna farms. An upcoming February webinar will discuss amateur radio and auxiliary communication support with the U.S. Department of Defense. The Federal Aviation Administration settles its 5G interference issues with the majority of airlines. Communication systems in Tonga are slowly recovering from the recent volcano explosion and the resulting tsunami. The next QSO Today virtual ham fest is coming up soon. We will have all the details. And... We will tell you about a ham who has made a contact a day, QRP, for the last 30 years, and he is still going. All that and a lot more are straight ahead on today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come along to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the Internet Domain Name System. He will discuss the recently passed Digital Services Act in the European Union, and he will talk about the mess that has developed between the FAA, the FCC, and the wireless carriers over the recently deployed 5G network. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will discuss what happens when you bring an up converter into your life. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take us back and take a look at amateur radio during World War II in the years 1939 and 1940. We will have the latest update from Vance Martin, N3VEM, from Parks and Summits on the Air. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will tell us about the best way to seal coaxial fittings from the elements. And, courtesy of Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, from the QSO Today podcast, we will hear an interview with Jeffrey Mendenhall, W8GNM. Eric interviews him about his early interest in electronics, germanium transistors, and later high-power triodes, which led him to a career as an engineer, designer, builder, and managing broadcast transmitter projects for Gates Radio, Broadcast Engineering, and later Harris Broadcast. All of that and a lot more are straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our snowbound headquarters studio here in chilly, frigid Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it looks like we may duck the blizzard, but we'll find out. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. From Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where it's going to get cold tonight, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our frozen solid Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where once again we await another snow event, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, has continued its largesse, funding a variety of projects through individual grants. With more details on the latest round of ARDC grants, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. Among the latest is a $900,000 award 
that will permit the Internet Archive to build a digital library of amateur radio and communication, an online open access resource that preserves the vital resources past, present, and future that document the history of amateur radio and communications, as the project proposal explained. Using the proceeds from the sale in 2019 of some 4 million unused consecutive AmperNet Internet addresses, ARDC has established a program of grants and scholarships with a strong emphasis on amateur radio. Another ARDC grant for nearly $34,000 will permit the Fauquier 4-H Ham Radio Club in Virginia to purchase and equip a 4-H youth station and outreach trailer for public demonstrations and special events. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit library of millions of free books, movies, software, music, websites, podcasts, and more. The Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications will be both an education program building a unique and unparalleled collection of primary and secondary resources, but also an innovative technical project that will build a digital library that combines both digitized print materials and original digital content, Internet Archive said in its proposal. An interesting side note is that This Week in Amateur Radio has been part of the Internet Archive since we began this service 23 years ago. The Internet Archive project will incorporate three distinct areas. A large-scale scanning program to digitize relevant print materials from institutions and individuals. A large-scale digital archiving initiative that seeks to curate, archive, and provide specialized access to such media as digital photos and audio-video presentations, as well as websites and web-published materials and a personal archiving campaign to ensure the preservation and future access of notable individuals and stakeholders involved in the founding and activities of ARDC and the broader community. A $318,000 grant to the Society of Women Engineers will fund 30 SWE Global Scholarships and contribute to programs that will help women in engineering excel professionally and showcase their achievements. According to SWE, these programs include the High School Leadership Academy, a virtual year-round program aimed at building self-confidence and resilience among high school students who are interested in pursuing engineering and technology degrees, the Community College Women of Color Pathways Research, a new year-long program to encourage undergraduate women studying at historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic-serving institutions to pursue STEM graduate degrees, and its Collegiate Leadership Institute a program designed to equip collegiate SWE members with the skills, knowledge, and leadership abilities that will enable them to become leaders in engineering and technology. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service Team of Centralia, Washington, activated following an early morning bombing on December 19th. Authorities say two men planted the bomb, which blew up the ATM at a local bank. The Washington State Patrol Bomb Squad and the FBI responded to assist the Centralia Police Department in the investigation. The Centralia Ares team staged its communications van next to the scene. The 13 Ares team members who responded to a call for assistance were paired with CPD detectives to assist in the evidence search at the crime scene. Ares team members had been trained to perform evidence searches for the police department and were able to put those skills to work. Teams of three to five Aries members, led by a detective, gloved up and slowly searched an estimated 10,000 square feet around the bank, along nearby railroad tracks and an adjoining field, retrieving as many potential pieces of evidence as they could find. The Aries team was released after about one hour. The Federal Communications Commission has established April 14, 2022, as the date by which amateur radio transmissions must stop in the upper 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz segment of the amateur secondary 9 centimeter band. Secondary operations are permitted to continue indefinitely in the remainder of the band, 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz, pending future FCC proceedings. On January 14th, the Commission released DA-22-39, which announces the results of Auction 110 for the 3.45 to 3.55 GHz band. Release of this notice triggered FCC rules adopted last year requiring that amateur radio operations between 3.45 GHz and 3.5 GHz cease within 90 days of the public notice. 
In October 2021, AWRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, urged Congress to direct the FCC to preserve amateur radio's secondary use of the 3 GHz band in a written statement responding to H.R. 5378, the Spectrum Innovation Act of 2021, before the U.S. House Commerce, Communications, and Technology Subcommittee. A chronology of actions responding to amateur access on the 3.5 GHz band can be found on the AWRL website. A December 17th commentary from the Center for Strategic and International Studies has concluded that over the past year, China has taken what it calls major steps to upgrade its capability to wage electronic warfare near the South China Sea. The Center for Strategic and International Studies cites satellite images of massive antenna complexes to back its claim. Some facilities have already been suspected of jamming the communication facilities of U.S. military aircraft operating in the region. The Chinese military is taking major steps toward improving its electronic warfare, communications, and intelligence gathering capabilities near the South China Sea, said the commentary by Matthew P. Funayol, Joseph S. Bermudez Jr., and Brian Hart, all associated with Center for Strategic and International Studies. Recent satellite imagery reveals that China has rapidly expanded facilities Mumayan on Hainan Island, providing the People's Liberation Army with greater ability to track and counter foreign military forces operating in the region and in outer space. The commentary said, many assets in the vicinity appear dedicated to gathering communications intelligence, a subset of signals intelligence that includes the collection of communications between individuals and organizations. Some of China's land claims in the South China Sea include rare DXCC entities, Scarborough Reef is one. Conflicting land claims exist for other islands, especially in the Spratlys. Further complicating the situation is a 2016 ruling from the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague that discounted China's claims with respect to Scarborough Reef and the Spratlys. The court ruled in favor of the Philippines in a dispute with China over Scarborough Reef. In April 2015, a Chinese naval vessel harassed a Philippine Air Force patrol flight in the Spratlys, according to one news account, by firing an illumination round. The incident postponed a Philippine Navy flight that was to evacuate an ailing participant of the DX-0P Spratly Islands de expedition. A private aircraft carrying a BBC reporter received radio warnings from the Chinese Navy to stay away from the South China Sea reefs and islands that China claims, strongly suggesting that China has expanded its sphere of influence to include the entire region. This and the more recent artificial island building in the South China Sea cloud the possibility of future de-expeditions to rare DXCC entities in the South China Sea, whether or not China has laid specific claim. The Spratlys are claimed in whole or in part by China, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries, and the Philippines government has issued the DX0P call sign. An international amateur radio team postponed a December 2017 de-expedition to the Spratly Islands operating under Malaysian call sign 9M0W, although the de-expedition did take place the following year. The planned 2012 DX0DX de-expedition to the Spratlys was canceled altogether without explanation after being pushed back at least twice. The last operation from Scarborough Reef was in 2007. On Thursday, February 18th at 0100, the evening of February 17th in North American time zones, the U.S. Army Network Enterprise Technology Command, or NETCOM, will hold a Zoom meeting to discuss amateur radio and AUXCOM support to the U.S. Department of Defense. During this presentation, the NETCOM representative will discuss the authorities for these operations, upcoming DOD exercise opportunities for 2022, where outreach to the amateur radio AUXCOM community will be a primary training objective. Use of the 560-meter channels and the concept for the types of amateur AUXCOM outreach. There will be an opportunity for Q&A throughout the presentation. Use the following Zoom link to attend. This is meeting ID 837-8115-4615 
and the passcode is 670-665. Jose Francisco de Almeida, Charlie Tango 4 Alpha November, is the International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System Coordinator from the REP, the Portuguese National Ham Radio Society. Jose informs us that ANACOM, the Portuguese Communications Authority, recently acted to eradicate interference and the abuse of several frequencies in the radio spectrum, including protection of the amateur bands. The Portuguese National Authority for Communications carried out a series of inspections together with the Maritime Police in an area between the ports of Camina and Peniche. The action aimed at verifying the status, operability and correct use of radio communications equipment installed on board vessels. In these inspections, the most frequently detected violations or anomalies are related to the use of frequencies not authorised or not assigned to the Maritime Mobile Service. If the equipment is not working properly or is not being operated correctly, including misuse in the wrong spectrum bands, it may interfere with other services and may impair emergency communications operations. The action was carried out in around 11 different ports around the Portuguese coastline. In total, 20 vessels were checked, ranging in role from coastal fishing, long-range fishing, hotel ships to pleasure boats. In these joint actions with the Maritime Police, detected violations related to the use of frequencies not authorised for use by the Maritime Mobile Service. In some cases, non-certified equipment or equipment not suitable for use on vessels, as well as unauthorised radio communication encryption devices, were detected. It is implied that some of these devices may have been operating in the amateur band allocations. In these actions, ANACOM carries out the actual inspections of the equipment, then it's up to the Maritime Police to take the necessary measures. And in the past, ANACOM operations such as this one have led to successful prosecutions. There's more at the website www.anacom.pt, including photographs of the actions. The page is in Portuguese, but an English translation button is provided. According to the publication Ars Technica, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has made major progress on the issue of interference between 5G transmissions and airline altimeters. For some models of Boeing, Airbus, and Embraer aircraft, radio interference isn't just an annoyance, it has the potential for deadly consequences. That was at the root of the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration's concern about 5G cellular signals, which use the same C-band spectrum as some of the airliner's altimeters. The FAA said planes landing in low visibility conditions risked interference from mobile phones, naming Verizon and AT&T as two of the carriers. Now, in a dramatic turnaround of its position, the FAA has said that more than three-quarters of planes have altimeters that can filter out 5G transmissions and are in the clear. Some telecom and consumer advocates, such as attorney Harold Feld, publicly criticized the FAA for taking too long to evaluate altimeters after the FCC approved the cellular carrier's use of the C-band last year. According to an article on the Ars Technica website, the FAA only began vetting the altimeters in February 2021 once the FCC had auctioned off the spectrum to the carriers. The Ars Technica article said that in 40 other countries where C-band spectrum is in use for cellular service, there have been no reports of 5G causing trouble with altimeters. In the U.S., the FCC standards place a 200 MHz guard band between the cellular frequencies and the frequencies used by the altimeters. More approvals for other aircraft are expected soon. Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel named two prominent radio amateurs among her appointments to the FCC Technological Advisory Council on January 19th. Appointed were Greg Lappin, N9GL, and Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. Lappin chairs the ARRL RF Safety Committee and has represented ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, on the Technological Advisory Council since 2001. ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, noted that Lappin has been involved with RF safety and the FCC since the last significant rule changes in 1998, he said. He is again helping the FCC prepare information on OET Bulletin 65 Supplement B for amateur radio, giving guidance for amateurs who need to comply with the FCC rules on RF exposure. His work is highly respected by the FCC and the ARRL lab, making it easier for amateurs to evaluate their stations. 
Thompson is Chief Executive Officer of the Open Research Institute, which she will represent on the TAC. ORI is a nonprofit research and development organization dedicated to open source work that includes such areas as amateur satellites and digital communications. She is an ARRL Life member. Thompson will discuss digital communications technology on February 10th at the ARRL National Convention in Orlando as part of the Technology Academy workshop track. The Technological Advisory Council serves to assist the Commission in identifying important areas of innovation and developing informed technology policies that support U.S. competitiveness in the global economy. The TAC will consider and advise the FCC on topics such as the upcoming 6G wireless, artificial intelligence, advanced spectrum sharing technologies, and emerging wireless technologies, including new tools to restore internet access during shutdowns and other disruptions. The Technological Advisory Council will hold its first meeting of the year on February 28th. The latest episode of ARRL's on the Air podcast, that's episode number 25, features a conversation with Mike Flugman, KE8AQW, about how to get started with CW. A lot of people say, you know, well, what device should I start with? And the answer is, it's really um, personal preference. Uh, some people feel that by using a straight key, you learn the rhythm of each character, and that muscle memory, along with your listening practice, will help you learn the code better. You need to be able to send and receive. You need both sides of the coin to be a good Morse code operator. And then other people prefer the paddle because it's easier to send cleaner sounding code since it will uh, make the DAWs and dashes for you. And it sometimes, uh, for some people's hands, uh, the motion is easier using paddles. So I'd suggest uh, find a ham friend who has one or both of those and then try them out. The On the Air podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Blueberry. The latest issue of the On the Air magazine contains an entire article on this subject. Efforts have been ongoing to restore communications to Tonga, where an undersea volcano left a vital fiber optic cable broken beneath the ocean, isolating the island nation. According to a BBC report, 2G wireless service has been set up on the archipelago's main island with the help of a satellite dish from the University of the South Pacific. Other than the intermittent service of satellite phones, however, outside contact has been limited as the country struggles with contaminated water supplies and other concerns brought on by a subsequent tsunami. Tonga apparently has no active amateur radio operators, and hams in the immediate Pacific region have reported that the amateur HF bands are presently unusable. Some marine VHF bands are said to be active. Hayden Honeywood, VK7HH, is among those amateurs using YouTube and other social media channels to provide updates whenever possible. One of Hayden's most recent accounts came from Roly, ZL1BQD, whose friend in Tonga operates a 1 kilowatt broadcast radio station at 91.3 FM. The station was unaffected by the tsunami and is carrying public service messages. Meanwhile, New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs estimate it will take at least a month, if not more, before the cable can be successfully repaired. An update now on a story we told you about last week. Amateurs in Germany are being reassured that their personal data has not been affected by a cyber attack on the DARC website. The Deutscher Amateur Radio Club is reassuring hams in Germany that the cyber attack, which exploited the vulnerability of a plug-in, does not appear to have compromised any member's data. The DARC said it successfully halted the January 15 attack and will not restore the full website to online status until it's convinced the site is completely secured again. A statement by the DARC board reaffirmed to members that their personal data is kept in folders that are distinct from the website and members' passwords to that website are stored encrypted. The board said it believed the attack was automated and was not launched specifically to collect members' data. Meanwhile, an IT company has been asked to conduct a forensic investigation. After an August storm damaged the satellite antenna that DP0GVN in Antarctica had been using for Q0-100, AMSAT DL has provided a new one. The new Q0-100 SATCOM ground station antenna arrived intact in Antarctica 
at New Mayor Station 3 in December, ensuring future operations by the 2022-2023 overwintering crew. AMSAT DL provided the appropriate radio equipment for DP0GVN at New Meyer Station 3, covering all costs for setup and provision of the required radio equipment and antenna, said AMSAT DL President Peter Goulzow. While amateur radio operations mostly take place during free time, contacts with schools have also been arranged on a regular basis. Similar to ARIS, such contacts in Antarctica are also something very special for the students. This will certainly also arouse interest in scientific or technical professions and, but not least, in amateur radio. DP0GVN is a permanent ham radio club station, which offers operation for residents as their responsibilities. Much of the activity is on Q0-100 satellite. The primary operator is Felix Rice, DP1POL forward slash DL5XL, who will be in Antarctica until mid-February. The organizers of the St. Patrick's Day Award are excited to announce the launch of a new web page where visitors can learn everything they need to know about the award. Many people worldwide celebrate St. Patrick's Day annually by going green, with many amateurs running special event stations as part of the festivities. St. Patrick's Day is a celebration of an Irish legend and a national holiday. The team encourages you to get on air with friends and family through this fun event to show and enjoy all the benefits of amateur radio. On the new webpage, you will also find the simple registration form to be completed by all participants in this year's festivities, which will be running from the 16th to the 18th of March 2022. Previous years have seen over 100 amateurs register to participate, and the team are hopeful that this will continue to grow. The award is an opportunity for amateurs around the world to celebrate St. Patrick's Day and turn the airwaves green. The new page can be accessed at www.stpatricksaward.com and Saint is just ST Sierra Tango. The award team look forward to celebrating with you all. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. That's one of the things they did right when they designed the web. They um, made it really easy for a domain name to point to any computer. The computer in this case is the web server. And you can move the web server somewhere else, but the name stays the same. And it was a, actually a very clever invention. That old DNS, and we talk about it a lot because it comes up a lot, DNS, Domain Name System, the big phone book of the Internet. Uh, that's how it works. You know, you, uh, you say you enter in somebody's name and the phone book gives you back the number and it's done automatically, transparently. People aren't aware of it. But that's why we can just say, you know, to the phone book, hey, techguylabs.com, it has a new home. And 64.72.3.1 or whatever it is, I don't know. See, I don't have to know. I don't have to remember that. No one does. Maybe maybe the engineers do. <laughs> nobody else. Nobody else does. The uh, EU has. You know, it's sad that we have to look to the European Union to enforce privacy and data protection laws. But you know, they seem to be a little more aggressive about this. Actually. If you ask somebody at Google or Microsoft or Apple or Amazon or Facebook, they might say, the darn EU has done it again. Just depends on your point of view. Thursday, the Digital Services Act passed the EU Parliament. And there were some apparently some significant last minute changes. But it's uh to it's about data privacy, it's about protecting your information. It's it's also about reducing tracking and advertising. One of the amendments was to ban targeted ads entirely. Boy, that would have changed the ecosystem, wouldn't it? Uh, that failed, but there was a compromise. You, now you cannot target minors with ad targeting. That's fair, right? Presumption being minors are you know, maybe uh, less sophisticated, more vulnerable, so they should be protected. Amendments extending the limitation to sensitive personal data did pass. So they can't keep track of your political, religious beliefs, sexual orientation. Online platforms cannot make denying consent. You know, when you see that pop-up says you consent for us to collect personal data, they can't 
make denying consent more complex than giving it. <laughs> you know, shouldn't have to jump through a lot of hoops to prevent them from collecting it. And maybe even more importantly, refusing consent, saying, no, don't collect any information, should not disable functionalities. How about that? Why do we care? Well, most of the sites we deal with also uh, work in Europe. So they kind of have to follow the EU rules. A lot of sites in the U.S., Facebook and others, might have a little switch. You know, they go, is this person in the EU? All right, okay. Okay, all right. But generally, anything the EU does kind of ends up happening here in the U.S. Not through law, but just through practice. Because sites don't want to have to figure out where you are. Have you been following the crazy battle between the FCC and the FAA over 5G deployment, the so-called C-band deployment? This is crazy. And it's kind of hard to get down to the bottom of this. Who's right? Who's wrong? The carriers spent billions of dollars for this frequency. You know, they they uh, they expected that they'd be able to use it. I think, you know, when you spend billions of dollars, you figure the FCC probably knows what it's doing when they're selling this. But meanwhile, the Federal, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, at the behest of the aircraft and the airline industry, said, hold on there. The problem comes down to altimeters. Which are, you know, I think you, <laughs> I think we can agree are fairly important to the, the flights uh, of commercial and non-commercial and all kinds of aircraft. You got to know where the ground is. Kind of fundamental, and a malfunctioning altimeter can cause a crash. These altimeters are designed, were designed back in the day, and that that's the phrase that's kind of relevant to watch a whole swath of the radio frequency spectrum. Much larger than they need, to be honest. Much larger than they need, but because no one else was using that uh, for those frequencies, they said fine, and they, wa they monitor all of them. Unfortunately, that's exactly where these 5G C-band deployments go. Not, I should point this out, not in the critical frequency that the altimeters need. It's just that they look at more than they need to. So they might be confused by signals in the in the lower band that they they really should don't even need to pay attention to it was just when they designed it no one was using them and they designed it you know in a broad fashion and of course and i agree with this in the aviation industry you don't want to just make changes because you for change sake safety is paramount and every change has some potential risks you want to make sure it's safe test it and all that they've known though for 10 years that the phone companies are going to put up towers in this 5G C band, if Verizon and AT&T, they bought it, they want it, they want to use it, and they did nothing about it. So now we've got this problem where 5G interference could cause safety problems. Cockpit safety systems could fail. And it's kind of, you can't say it's whose fault it is exactly. Uh, the carriers paid for the frequency. The altimeter manufacturers, when they made this, didn't have to worry about that extra frequency. The airlines trusted them, and now collision. So one agreement that was made this week between AT&T and, Ver and Verizon and the FAA was to not build these C-band towers around major airports. Had they done so, had they started putting those up, the airline companies and the airplane manufacturers were going to ground those jets. They are going to just say, well, we can't fly them. However... In San Francisco, at least, some commuter flights on smaller jets were barred from landing this week in San Francisco because the FAA hadn't cleared them for low visibility conditions. So there already are some disruptions. A lot of people are saying, I'm hearing this from uh, telecom experts. This is such a, it's botched. They're not blaming anybody, but it's so botched that we're falling behind in 5G. And 5G, they say, is very important. And uh, by not doing this right by everybody kind of messing up and there was some urgency the fcc called its agenda to promote i'm reading from the wall street journal its agenda to promote the next generation wireless the 5g fast plan lawmakers drafted a bill called beat china for 5g act <laughs> it's not a race kids so what's the upshot of this it's a mess it's a mess basically they're going to have to, I guess, update these altimeters. It's going to cost uh, money, lots of it. 
And, of course, there's always this concern when you make these changes that you have to test them, make sure they're safe. It's working now. They say, you know, the FAA says and the manufacturers and the airlines say, hey, notice how safe air travel is these days. Well, that's because we're very careful. FCC says, well, you don't need that frequency. You shouldn't have that frequency. We sold it. <laughs> we sold it. Late Monday, Boeing and advised customers like the Emirates Airline, the all-Nippon Airways, that their 777 wide bodies could not fly to airports in the U.S. where that 5G is about to be deployed. They're blocked. Same problem with the 747-8. So the, the wireless services went live on Wednesday. But no cell tower within two miles of a major runway will use the new signals. Verizon had to downgrade their estimate about how many people would get this 5G. It's a mess. It's, you know what? That's the bottom line. If you're curious what's going on, it's a mess. That's the answer. It's a mess. <sighs> and it's just a bureaucratic uh, nightmare. And, you, you know, I don't. Uh, people want to blame the FCC or the FAA or the airlines or the airplane manufacturers. You know, I don't know if that's fair. It's just, it's a mess. I'll read it to you now. Because uh, it kind of explained to me what was really going on. Probably a better, a, a better explanation than mine, to be honest. Your airplane, he's talking to pilots, is equipped with a radio uh, radar altimeter that operates between 40, 200 megahertz and 4,400 megahertz, 42 to 4,400. The 5G towers operate 3,700, 3,980, right? Shouldn't be a collision. However, there's a filter, a many decades old design that causes a big problem the filter, they, they all, all, all of the, the use filters, they call them band guards to prevent overlapping and interfering frequencies. The band guard between 5G and radio altimeters is very big. The airplane opens a channel so wide to listen to the radar, it'll end up listening to the 5G. That makes sense, right? It's just, it's very big. That wasn't a problem, you know, until now. It's not at all unusual to have filters that are, you know, band guards that are much smaller and they work fine. In fact, there's plenty of examples of that with modern filters. Modern filters should be in all airplanes by now, especially since the 5G standard's been out for more than a decade. The aviation industry had time to retrofit their airplanes. They are now, sorry to be blunt, playing dumb. They know they can hold nations hostage by saying this will disrupt flights in the middle of a pandemic. They gather support from the populace. Obviously, safety is paramount. But carriers paid many $81 billion for these frequencies. <laughs> so they're upset, right? The aviation industry is saying, well, we need more than the 42 to 4,400 for our altimeters. But Spectrum is a limited resource. So really what's come down to is who's going to pay for this? And uh, the airline industry, the altimeter manufacturers want somebody else to pay for it, right? But the aviation industry, understandably, doesn't also want to rush into this. So fascinating conversation. And I'm trying to give you both sides because I think what a lot of what you hear, not just on this story, but every story, is blame. Oh, it's their fault. Finger pointing. And I just want you, both sides have some blame, but you see how this can happen. But oof, what a mess. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. World War II started on September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. By May 1940, Germany had conquered much of Europe and had her sights on Britain. Although the United States was officially neutral, it was obvious that our sympathies were with the Allies. In addition, it was clear to a few prospective Americans that we would be drawn into the conflict. Amateur radio operators, like most Americans, began to gear up for war. 
On June 4, 1940, the FCC issued Order No. 72, which prohibited amateurs from engaging in foreign communications or from establishing contact with any or all points outside the continental U.S. and its possessions. The FCC was quite serious about this. They revoked the licenses of several hams who had contact with foreign stations. The How's DX column was jokingly called, Where's DX? So many foreign hams, including our neighbors in Canada, had been off the air since September 1939. Throughout 1940 and 1941, the face of amateur radio changed with the darkening war cloud. The War Department sent out a questionnaire to all hams to obtain data on equipment, experience, physical fitness, and availability for service. Columns devoted to the military began to appear, such as Army Amateur Radio System Activities, which included the schedule of station WAR on 4025 and 6990 kilocycles. Other columns were Naval Communication Reserve Notes, In the Services, which listed amateurs now in military service, and USA Calling, which published requests from the Navy, Marines, Army, Army Air Corps, Signal Corps, and Merchant Marine, and even the FBI, for amateurs proficient as radio operators, electronic specialists, electrical engineers, and communications officers. In the summer of 1940, the British used the USA Calling column to issue an urgent appeal for radio servicemen and amateurs for their civilian technical corps. Up to 25,000 Americans were requested by the British. Foreign espionage invaded the ham bands in 1940. The FBI, in a successful bid to capture several foreign agents in the U.S., operated a counter-espionage station in the 20-meter band. Using a phony amateur call, the FBI passed over 500 messages to various spies before arresting them. Amateurs were members of the Defense Communication Board, which met every week to prepare for a military emergency. Amateurs also made their own preparations for a national emergency. QST ran several editorials urging hams to improve their CW skills. Many articles appeared on emergency equipment such as vibrator power supplies to supply the B-plus voltage for tubes, battery-operated radios, and mobile stations. The two and a half meter band, which ran from 112 to 116 megacycles, was chosen as the primary civil defense band, and every issue of QST had another two and a half meter construction project, including a few walkie talkies. Civil defense coordination and participation was urged. On July 22, 1941, the FCC, in response to the national emergency, announced that the 3650 to 3950 kilocycle portion of 80 meters would be withdrawn from amateur use and reassigned to the military for use as an aircraft pilot training program. Amateurs were given a few months to vacate the band and preparations were made to move popular 80 meter nets to 160. But before the reassignment was completed in December 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked. On December 8, 1941, the FCC issued Order No. 87, which read in part, Whereas a state of war exists between the United States and the Imperial Japanese government, and the withdrawal from private use of all amateur frequencies is required for the purpose of national defense, it is ordered that except as may hereafter be specifically authorized by the Commission, no person shall engage in any amateur radio operation, and all frequencies heretofore allocated to amateur radio stations under Part 12 of the Rules and Regulations are hereby withdrawn. All amateur licenses are hereby notified that the Commission has ordered the immediate suspension of all amateur radio operation in the continental U.S., its territories, and possessions. However, the FCC left a small loophole for amateur operation during the war. Amateurs would be allowed to operate for the purpose of national defense upon application of a federal, state, or local official. In our next installment, we will look at some amateur operations during World War II. Some will surprise you. Here are some news briefs of interest to amateurs. Winter Field Day takes place over the January 29th and 30th weekend. It runs for 24 hours from Saturday at 1900 UTC to Sunday at 1900 UTC. 
The goal of the Winter Field Day Association is to enhance operating skills and prepare participants for all environmental conditions found in the U.S. and Canada. The Radio Society of Great Britain reports that Ofcom licensed radio amateurs may celebrate Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee by adding the letter Q before the numeral in their call signs. Amateurs in the UK who are planning to operate this June in celebration of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee should keep their eyes on the website of the Radio Society of Great Britain. Ofcom has granted permission for the call signs to include the special regional secondary locator letter Q, but its use will require a notice of variation. The website rsgb.org will carry those details shortly. For example, G4WQG in England would identify as GQ4WQG throughout June. Stations throughout the UK can apply to Ofcom for a notice of variation. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II is Britain's longest reigning monarch and thus the first to celebrate a platinum jubilee. Special use call signs have been used by hams for previous occasions, including the Queen's Golden Jubilee in 2002 and her Diamond Jubilee in 2012. The Boston Marathon is seeking amateur radio volunteers for its Patriots Day event in April. New volunteers can sign up online. The site includes a step-by-step -step guide on how to select amateur radio volunteer positions during the registration process. You can email questions to the Boston Marathon Communications Committee from their web page. Nominations for the 2022 Amateur Radio Software Award are being accepted until February 14, 2022. The Amateur Radio Software Award is an annual international award to recognize software projects that enhance amateur radio. The award aims to promote innovative, free, and open amateur radio software development. Previous winners have included Jordan Scherer, KN4CRD, for JS8 Call, and Anthony Good, K3NG, for the K3NG Arduino CW Keyer. A nomination form is on the award website. The CW-only Maritime Radio Day 2022 is set for 1,200 UTC on April 14th until 2,200 UTC on April 15th. Bands will include 160, 80, 40, 30, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Certificates and QSLs are available. This will mark the 11th anniversary of the event held to commemorate the many years of CW wireless service for seafarers. Former U.S. Merchant Marine wireless operators, fisheries, and coastal stations may register and participate. Radio amateurs and shortwave listeners are welcome. Former maritime radio officers should register in advance by April 1st. Operating frequencies will focus on 1,824, 3,520, 7,020, 10,118, 14,052, 21,052, and 28,052 kilohertz. The primary working frequency is 14,052 kilohertz. There is no power limit. And finally, the non-competitive St. Patrick's Award on the Air event will take place March 16th through the 18th. The St. Patrick Award encourages radio amateurs worldwide to join the celebration by going green for St. Patrick's Day. And now, with this week's propagation forecast report, we go back to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who reports from League Headquarters. Ted Cook, K7RA in Seattle, says a new sunspot group appeared on January 20th, another on January 24th, two more on January 25th, and one more on January 26th. But overall, solar activity declined from the previous week, January 13th through the 19th. Average daily sunspot number declined from 94.4 to 39.6. And average daily solar flux went from 112 to 97.6. Here's the perspective from the space weather woman, Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. 
We also have a few regions on our Earth-facing disk that are solar storm producers. Now, right now, the sun is kind of launching solar storms willy-nilly, and Earth doesn't seem to be in the crosshairs. But it could change here over the next couple days as some of these regions rotate through that Earth strike zone. So we're definitely going to be paying attention there. Space weather woman Tamitha Skov, WX6SWW. NASA caught sight of an explosion more than 100 million kilometers from Earth. The explosion was a solar flare, a powerful burst of energy on the Sun, that was caught by NASA's Sun Observing Solar Dynamics Observatory on January the 20th. The Solar Dynamics Observatory watches the Sun constantly, and it captured several images of the event. The images show the solar flare as a bright flash on the right-hand side of the Sun. Solar flares and eruptions can impact radio communications, electric power grids, and navigation signals on Earth. They also pose risks to spacecraft and astronauts. This flare was classified as an M5.5 class flare on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Space Weather Scale, which is considered to be of moderate strength. Solar flares like this are essentially a massive release of electromagnetic radiation. When an outburst occurs, the radiation spreads out across our solar system at the speed of light. If it's powerful enough, the burst of energy can directly influence radio waves, electronics, and other Earth-based technologies. This particular flare had the potential to black out high-frequency radio communications for tens of minutes on Earth's sunlit side. The blackouts primarily affect high-frequency shortwave communication, impacting the 3 to 30 MHz part of the spectrum. Solar flares do not tend to affect smartphone GPS systems or the most modern navigational technology. Solar flares usually take place in areas on the Sun marked by the presence of strong magnetic fields called active regions. As these magnetic fields evolve, they can reach a point of instability and release energy in a variety of forms, including electromagnetic radiation, which are observed as solar flares. The NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center is the U.S. government's official source for space weather forecasts, watches, warnings, and alerts. NASA works as a research arm of the nation's space weather effort by constantly observing the sun and our space environment with a fleet of spacecraft that study everything from the sun's activity to the solar atmosphere and the magnetic fields in the space surrounding Earth. You can find out more by reading the article at metro.co.uk. Time now for the AMSAT report. We're not sure how many people realize that AMSAT is a 100% volunteer organization with no one on the payroll. All the satellites that are designed, tested, built, and commanded are done by volunteers. Those who are passionate about satellites volunteer their time. If you'd like to volunteer, there's a link on the amsat.org website. It's at the very bottom of the home page in the last sentence. Some of the volunteer positions, of course, are related to satellite development and require technical expertise. They also want volunteers to help write the AMSAT news articles or be an assistant editor for the AMSAT journal. There's a need for web design, website maintenance, and writing technical or instructional material. There are many other slots, too. If you're interested in helping, download the form, complete as best as you can before you submit it. AMSAT says it doesn't know who you are and what you can do unless you express an interest. The AMSAT Report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. BBC News reports a rocket launched by Elon Musk's space exploration company is on course to crash into the moon and explode. The Falcon 9 booster was launched in 2015, but after completing its mission, it did not have enough fuel to return towards Earth and instead remained in space. Astronomer Jonathan McDowell told BBC News, it will be the first known uncontrolled rocket collision with the moon. The rocket was abandoned in high orbit seven years ago after it completed a mission to send a space weather satellite on a million mile journey. It was part of Mr. Musk's space exploration program, SpaceX, a commercial company that ultimately aims to get humans living on other planets. Since 2015, the rocket has been pulled by different gravitational forces of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, making its orbit somewhat chaotic, explains Professor McDowell, from the U.S.-based Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's been dead just following the laws of gravity. It's joined millions of other pieces of space junk, 
machinery discarded in space after completing missions without enough energy to return to Earth. The collision is due to happen on March 4th, where the rocket will explode as it makes contact. It's basically a four-ton empty metal tank with a rocket engine on the back. And so, if you imagine throwing that at a rock at 5,000 miles an hour, it's not going to be happy, Professor McDowell says. It will leave a small artificial crater on the moon's surface. Bill Gray, who uses software to track near-Earth space objects, projects that it made a close flyby on January 5th. On March 4th, it's likely to hit the moon far side, he says. In 2009, Professor McDowell and other astronomers performed an experiment in which a similar-sized rocket was crashed into the moon. Sensors gathered evidence of the collision so they could study the crater. This means scientists are unlikely to learn anything new from this crash, Professor McDowell explains. He adds that while there are no consequences now to space debris left to drift and occasionally crash, there could be in the future. If we get into the future where there are cities and bases on the moon, we want to know what's out there. It's much easier to get that organized when there is slow traffic in space, rather than waiting until it's a problem. And what happens between now and March 4th? Well, the rocket will continue to follow the laws of gravity, careening through space before it ends it stays smashing into the moon. AMSAT DL reports that the very first Q0100 satellite de-expedition on the island of Svalbard, a remote archipelago between Norway and the North Pole, will take place between April the 22nd and the 24th, 2022. Operation will be from Cap Line, located at 78 degrees north. The team consists of Cedric, Oscar November 4, Charlie Kilo Mike, Max, Oscar November 5, Uniform Romeo, and Patrick, Oscar November 4, Delta Charlie Uniform. They'll operate two Q0100 satellite stations under the call signs Juliet Whiskey Zero Whiskey and Juliet Whiskey 100 Quebec Oscar, while JW0X will be used by another team for contacts on shortwave. With Q0100 only three degrees above the horizon at this location, Cap Ligne was the only suitable place to operate, due to Svalbard being right on the edge of the satellite footprint. Looking for a suitable location to stay and getting there is one of the biggest challenges and cost drivers for the team. This is indeed a unique opportunity to work this rare location and DXCC via satellite. And if they're lucky, the Svalbard team might also be able to contact Delta Papa Zero Golf Victor November at the German Antarctic Research Station Neumeyer 3 for a north-south distance record via satellite Q0100. You can find out more information at amsat-dl.org. Foundations of Amateur Radio A couple of days ago, after months of anticipation, an unassuming little box arrived on my doorstep. Inside the box was a nondescript electronic device, with two SMA connectors and a USB socket. Other than the branding, there were no markings on the device, and it came without any instructions. It did come with a couple of SMA adapters, which came in handy. A little research later determined which of the two SMA adapters connected to an antenna and which connected to a radio. The gadget itself is called an up converter. It's an interesting little device that essentially mixes two frequencies together, creating two new ones. Start with say 720 kilohertz and mix it with 120 megahertz, and you end up with 120.72 megahertz and 119.28 megahertz. In other words, if you mix two frequencies together, you end up with both the sum and the difference of those frequencies. If you have a radio that can listen to 120 MHz, but cannot listen to 720 kHz, then using an up converter, you can, as it were, expand the frequency range of your radio to hear different signals. I purchased the up converter with the intent of connecting it to my Pluto SDR, since the lowest frequency it can do is 70 MHz. Combine the two and I should be able to listen to all of the amateur HF frequencies at once. Given that my Pluto SDR is currently doing something else, I had a look at using the up converter with my Whisper Beacon monitor that uses an RTL SDR dongle. Technically it's not required since my particular dongle can be used to tune to HF frequencies, but as an experiment it works well enough. So I connected the antenna to the up converter, the up converter to the dongle, and the dongle to a Raspberry Pi a single board computer that runs Linux. 
essentially the exact same setup I've been running for years, except that I inserted the up converter between the dongle and the antenna. That, and some power, took care of the hardware. The software initially gave me some challenges. After discovering that the tool I'm using, RTL SDR Whisper D, has an option for an up converter, I was up and running in minutes. So, at the moment, and for the next foreseeable little while, my Whisper monitor is using an up converter to scan HF. Technically, this should increase the sensitivity by a significant amount, since the dongle is better suited to tuning to higher frequencies than it is to lower ones, but only time will tell. I updated my monitoring scripts to take into account if the frequency I was monitoring was out of range, so it currently won't report on anything above 60 MHz, but then that's fine for what I'm working on. I've updated the script on GitHub if you want to have a look. It's nothing fancy, it essentially checks to see if there's a file called upconverter, and if so, it calls a slightly different monitoring script. Given that I have existing logging data associated with this monitor, I should be able to discover if there's any significant difference between what I've been monitoring to date and what's coming in now that an upconverter is in the listening chain. Theoretically, I should be able to hear weaker signals, but time will tell. One thing that was interesting, whilst I was discovering how this all works and hangs together, is that it wasn't immediately obvious how to set it all up in software. I tried several tools to make sense of the data. In the end, the combination of GQRX, setting the local oscillator offset to a negative frequency, in my case 120 MHz, got me to the point where I could set the frequency to 720 kHz and hear my local broadcast station, whilst the software, actually, secretly behind the scenes, added 120 MHz to that and tuned the radio to 120.720 MHz. Once I got my head around that, things started falling into place. The same is true for RTL SDR Whisper D, adding the up converter flag with a value of 120 MHz, got my monitoring station up and running. This is a pretty user-friendly way of getting started with frequency mixers. You might recall my exploration into components apparently made from unobtainium. The intent is to use a variable frequency to achieve a similar thing, but that's a project still on the drawing board. For now, I have a fixed frequency, 120 MHz, which is plenty to get started. If you're curious why I'd want a stable variable frequency, consider for example what might happen if you transmit from a HF frequency into an up converter. Perhaps you could use your HF capable whisper beacon to make a signal on 2 meters or 70 centimeters. 120 MHz won't cut it, but perhaps you can work out what's needed to get from the 10 meter whisper band to the 2 meter whisper band, or the 70 centimeter whisper band. I'm on it, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike with your 2021 December and year end Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, with 2021 now in the books, Parks on the Air would like to thank the nearly 4,000 activators and 122,000 hunters who combined forces to make over 2.6 million contacts from over 10,000 parks in 45 different DXCC entities for 2021. Of particular note, we would like to congratulate Bill, K4NYM, who completed 1,260 activations for the year and David, NG5E, who activated 421 different parks. Congratulations are also due to Gene, NT2A, who hunted 5,458 parks, and Joe, N3XLS, who made 11,467 hunter QSOs in 2021. We also want to give special acknowledgement to two hunters, N5HA, Kenneth Bailey, and W9AV, Clint Sprott, who managed to hunt at least one park every day in 2021. There are several folks, including myself, who are going to attempt the same feat in 2022, so stay tuned to the monthly POTA updates to see how the 2022 Bailey Sprott Park A Day Challenge is progressing, or follow along on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtags Bailey Sprott and Park A Day. From the admin team at Parks on the Air, thank you for making 2021 a blowout year for the Parks on the Air program, and we look forward to having just as much fun in 2022. And now for the monthly stats update. There was plenty of activity in the month of December to help end the year strong. The month was one of the busiest of the year, with nearly 350,000 contacts made by about 1,400 operators. 
These individuals put approximately 3,000 parks on the air from 23 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were K7CAR with 9,808 QSOs and POTA's own WT8J who activated 69 different parks. The top hunters for the month were KB3WAV with 2,305 QSOs and K9ICP who hunted 918 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, England was our Region 1 leader with 641 QSOs, Canada was our Region 2 leader with approximately 16,000 QSOs, and Japan was our Region 3 leader with a little over 5,000 QSOs. The top DX activator for the month was VE7NB with 2,128 QSOs from 54 different parks. Outside of North America, the top activator was JF7RJM with 1,092 QSOs from 26 different parks. We're going to expand on one of our news items, the Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge. In 2021, these two operators, N5HA and W9AV, managed to hunt a park every day in 2021. There were, however, a number of individuals who came very close to accomplishing the same feat, only missing the mark by five days or less. Those operators include KW2DX, KO4SB, K9ICP, VE3LDT, WB3AVD, and AA5UZ. Just as remarkably, there was one activator who was only 18 days short of having done an activation every day of the year. That activator was Bill, K4NYM. There were several others who managed to do activations for two-thirds of the year or more. K9ZIE, KN4SWS, KB3WAV, and K5DGR. Watching these operators inspired myself and several others to attempt to hunt a park every day in 2022, and it may have inspired some to see if they can do the same for activations. During the 2022 monthly updates, part of the monthly stats feature will include an update on the progress toward these goals. To allow for wiggle room due to the timing of logs being submitted, the results will generally be shared backdated by two weeks. To get the ball rolling, however, as of today, when reviewing logs through January 7th, 2022, it appears as though we have several activators who have done a park a day so far, and approximately 160 hunters. This concludes our December 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. AMSAT EA in Spain has said it appears that ESAT 2 and Hades are transmitting and that weak signals have been heard, but the satellite's antennas may not have deployed. With more details on the current condition of these two amateur satellites, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report through ARRL Audio News. We confirm the reception of both ESAT 2 which is now SO114, and Hades, which is SO115, as well as the decoding of telemetry and the FM recorded voice beacon with the call sign AM5SAT of ESAT2. AMSAT EA reports that signals from Hades are weaker than those from ESAT2, most likely, it said, because the onboard computer has not yet managed to deploy the antennas either, although it will continue trying to do so. The reason the signals are suspected to be weaker at Hades is that the antennas are more tightly folded than those of ESAT-2. In any case, AMSAT Spain says, great news. AMSAT Spain is asking amateurs with very high gain antennas to try to receive them, especially the Hades satellite. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. EASAT2 appears to be working well, except for the deployment of the antennas, something that apparently has not yet occurred and causes weak signals, said AMSAT EA mission manager Felix Paez, EA4GQS. However, the AMSAT EA team confirms that based on the reception of FSK, CW, and the FM voice beacon, and the telemetry data that has been decoded, it can be said the satellite is working perfectly. In the event of low battery or system malfunction, the onboard computer would not transmit CW messages or the voice beacon call sign, as it would be in safe mode with only fast and slow telemetry transmissions. 
At the request of AMSAT EA, ESAT 2 has been designated as Spain Oscar 114 or SO 114, and Hades as Spain Oscar 115 or SO 115. These signals that confirm the operation of both satellites were received by Daniel Estevez, EA 4 GPZ, at 1807 UTC on Saturday, January 15th using two antennas from the Allen Telescope Array. Doppler observations from the co-launched Delphi PQ satellite and amateur radio communities have been used to identify these satellites' orbits, or TLEs. AMSET-4EA reports that Estevez performed a preliminary analysis using just one polarization of one of the Allen Telescope Array satellite dishes. ESAT-2 was detected and a relatively strong signal close to the Delphi PQ signal obtaining voice FM beacon transmissions and FSK, FSK-CW at 50 baud, AMSAT-EA said. The CW beacon clearly shows message VVV, AM5SAT, SOLYPLYAA, which is one of the several that both satellites emit, and although the call sign AM5SAT confirms that it's ESAT-2, AMSAT-EA said, in a recording made by EA4GPZ, there's also a faint trace confirming that to be from Hades, and stronger packets probably from the IRIS-A satellite. In any case, this is great news, since the transmission pattern confirms the proper functioning of the satellite. In the observations, you can see the FSK tones at the deviation of about 5 kHz interspersed with the FM carrier corresponding to the voice beacon of that satellite, which has call sign AMSAT-6, the AMSAT-EA team is working to decode the telemetry signals and obtain more detailed information on the state of that satellite. AMSAT is asking amateurs with very high-gain antennas to try and receive them, especially the Hades. If we could decode telemetry, it would be very helpful to us, AMSAT-EA said. Until antennas are deployed, it would be very difficult to use their repeaters or to receive any slow-scan TV images. We hope this will happen sooner or later, at least because if the computer doesn't succeed in applying heat to the resistor where the thread containing retaining the antennas is attached, with time, the thread should break loose due to space environment conditions. The ARRL Puerto Rico section and the American Red Cross Puerto Rico chapter signed a new Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, on January 13th. The Memorandum of Understanding calls on the ARRL Puerto Rico section to offer any assistance and emergency communication support to the American Red Cross should their communication systems fail or become disrupted. American Red Cross Regional Executive Lee Vanessa Feliciano, Puerto Rico Section Manager Rene Fonseca, NP3O, and Section Emergency Coordinator William Planis Montes, NP3WP, signed for their respective organizations. Hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017 prompted renewal of the MOU. Following Hurricane Maria, the American Red Cross asked ARRL to provide amateur radio volunteers to assist on-site for about six weeks. Among other provisions, the MOU calls on both organizations to encourage their units to engage in discussions with their field units to develop plans for local response or disaster relief operations. It also calls on each party to participate in community preparedness as well as an ARRL field day, the ARRL simulated emergency test, and other emergency exercises. Also present for the signing were logistics specialist Nora Benia and regional disaster officer Joseph Guzman from the Puerto Rico Red Cross. Puerto Rico Assistant Section Emergency Coordinator James Perez, KP4WA, and Section Traffic Manager Emmanuel Cruz, NP4D, represented ARRL. Perez arranged the signing ceremony. The MOU is for a three-year term and is renewable. An initial MOU was signed in 2017, and a second one was signed in 2019. Since then, the amateur radio population has grown to more than 4,900, indicating an interest in maintaining communication in emergencies and disasters. What's become a regular March event, the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will be held live from March 12th and 13th and then on demand for 30 days afterward. With more details on this popular virtual ham fest, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. 
More than 60 speakers will deliver presentations on their subject areas. There's content for everyone, whether a newly licensed TAM looking for the next steps to use that license, or a 30-plus year experience TAM looking for new projects. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo organizers promise. Virtual visitors may watch as many presentations as they want and return anytime within 30 days to view speakers and presentations they may have missed as well as explore exhibitor offerings. The Virtual Ham Expo will debut new technology that organizers say will further improve the live video interaction experience with exhibitors and fellow operators. Early bird tickets go on sale on February 1st. Tickets are $10 through March 6th. Visit www.qsotodayhamexpo, that's all one word, dot com. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. An example of a few of the upcoming presentations will include Core HF Communication Concepts, Fundamentals of Shortwave Propagation, Deep Dive of an FPGA DVB S2 Implementation, Fun with a Nano VNA, and Helically Wound Vertical for 160 Meters. The complete list of presentations is available from the Virtual Ham Expo homepage. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG. Jeffrey Mendenhall, W8GNM's early interest in electronics, germanium transistors, and later high power triodes, led him to a career as an engineer designing, building, and managing broadcast transmitter projects for Gates Radio and later Harris. Jeff made a presentation in the last QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo on beverage antennas, urging us to try building beverages even if conditions are not optimal, and being surprised by the result. WAGNM is my QSO Today. WAGNM, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Jeff? QSL, I'm here, alive and well and ready to talk. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, it started uh, actually a little bit before I got licensed as a ham. I, I built my first 7-in-1 electronics kit from Olson Radio when I was uh, about eight years old. It had a single 6SN7 dual triode in it, and that kind of got me really interested in electronics. And, uh, of course, one of my favorite projects was a phono oscillator transmitter that I could transmit on the broadcast band uh, to my neighbors with. So. And then in um, a few years later, I got my novice uh, license in October 1961 when I was 14 years old. That's about almost 61 years ago. What happened between those years? Were you building kits? You just had one kit? Were you building Heath kits? Did you have any encouragement from your friends and family to be involved in electronics? Oh, sure. Uh, I, yes, from... From my first 7-in-1 electronic kit to when I got my ham license and built my first ham rig, uh, I built a lot of homebrew things, mainly not kits. Um, I had, um, um, you may, some of the older hams may recall the Raytheon CK722 uh, germanium transistors that uh, first became available to hobbyists. And so I had all of the Raytheon application uh, books and uh, and then came up with some things of my own. So I built all sorts of projects, not only radio projects, but uh, uh, photo detector projects and code practice oscillators and other kinds of uh, things with the, uh, the very early Raytheon uh, germanium transistors. What was the source of those transistors at the time? A neighborhood electronics store would have those or surplus outlets? Well, you know, I lived in uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and we had a uh, radio parts store uh, that carried uh, replacement parts for television sets, primarily TV repair shops uh, purchased their parts there. And they had some things for experimenters. They had a few ham radio things. And I used to hang out at a uh, TV repair shop uh, with a guy named Paul Berkey and a, another guy who became an Elmer when I was a ham, Clyde May. They both had TV repair businesses, and uh, so I, I learned more about electronics there. 
and ultimately uh, got parts to build my first uh, ham radio transmitter from the TV repair shops. So at age 14, when you got your first license, that was your novice license? Yes. Yeah, I was uh, first licensed as uh, KN3VLN. Victor loves Nancy. <laughs> I believe in those days that novice license was only good for a year? Yes, that's correct. And so you upgraded that year? Yes. Yeah, within, within six months, I upgraded to technician. And then, uh, oh, a year or two later, I upgraded to general. And your call sign changed to? K3VLN. Kilo 3 Victor, London, Nancy. Okay, so you're a technician at age 15, 16. What did you do? How did you get on the air as a technician class licensee? Well, let's see. As I said, my first rig was a CW rig only. It was uh, an 807 driven by a 6AG7, one of those kind of standard rigs. And then I did build a night kit T150 that had a pair of 6146s in it. It would operate on six meters. I built my own six meter beam antenna. That was still in the days of AM and getting getting into sideband. Uh, and a matter of fact, later I I, uh, I didn't have enough budget to, to buy a sideband rig, but I actually converted the Night Kit T150 to a double sideband suppressed carrier transmitter, uh, which was kind of like fake sidebands. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, listening on upper or lower sideband thought I was single sideband, but I was actually double sideband. In Johnstown, Pennsylvania, the school that you went to, did you go to public school or did you go to private school? And did they have an electronics program? I went to public school. No, they did not have an electronics program. They had a pretty good uh, sciences program in math and uh, chemistry and physics. And of course, they had industrial arts. My, some of my favorite classes were shop. So I took a uh, wood shop and metal shop and learned how to build things uh, with my hands. I did have a science teacher who was uh, got us very active in uh, science fairs, uh, local and regional, and actually uh, went on to a national science fair. We also had a, uh, uh, a, man, a person from management at one of the uh, technology companies in town who uh, sponsored a junior engineering and technical society group in Johnstown. And so I was very active in science fairs. Uh, I built a number of different things. I remember building a, a radio controlled a bus from scratch, built all the radios and everything in it. Uh, but the uh, kind of my, my crowning achievement in the science fair arena was a six meter linear amplifier uh, that I built. It used a single 4-400A tube, but it was in a, in a kind of a unique operating mode. It, it had active screen voltage it was a grounded grid amplifier, but it had a lot more gain than a typical triode amplifier. And uh, one of my Elmers, Bill Orr, W6SAI, was who was an executive with IMAC, uh, gave me my first 4-400A for the science fair, and he was very encouraging, uh, helped me a lot. Actually, I wound up going to uh, New York City to the National Jet Science Fair with that project. And how did you know Bill Orr? Just, uh, you know, through ham radio, I, I actually, I, first time I contacted him, I don't think I'd even worked him at that time, but I just wrote him a nice letter, said I was a high school student working on a science fair project. Did they have any reject 4-400s that I could buy at a discount? And I told him about my proposal to build this uh, six meter linear amplifier. He was very nice. He wrote me a nice letter back and sent me a brand new tube. <laughs> It was not a reject. And uh, it, what was interesting is, as you'll hear later in my career, I, I wound up uh, eventually buying millions of dollars for, of tubes from Bill Orr and IMAC uh, when I was uh, executive at Harris Corporation. We were buying uh, large tubes for broadcast transmit. Well, you know, it pays to be generous to kids then. Yes, it does. Yeah, his generosity paid off. They'll remember. Yes, and I, I used to meet him face to face many, many times over the years at the National Association of Broadcasters show and, and uh, out at the IMAC factory in California. I visited there several times as well. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Well, as a matter of fact, ham radio did have a big impact on my selection of school. I, had, I, uh, I did want to study electrical engineering and I considered a number of different schools, including uh, Penn State, which was in Pennsylvania, not far away, and uh, Carnegie Tech, it was Carnegie Mellon at that time. But I uh, had a couple of ham buddies 
who were a year or two older than me that went to Georgia Tech in Atlanta, and they just raved about Georgia Tech. And so I uh, put that on my list and got my parents to take me down there and look at it. It was very attractive to me because it was a little further from home. It's that that age when you want to put a little distance between you and your parents. And uh, it was a school that combined a very good education in uh, engineering theory, but also a lot of practical hands-on things. Uh, and so uh, I did select Georgia Tech and I worked out sort of my own co-op program. I worked my way through school, primarily working at uh, WAGA TV, which was the store broadcasting uh, and CBS affiliate. It was the Southern uh, News uh, Gathering uh, newsroom for CBS News. And that led to a lot of interesting uh, work uh, as a cameraman and a technician for WAGA. But I did uh, did attend Georgia Tech from uh, uh, 1965 and graduated in 1970 with an electrical engineering degree. And was that a BSEE or did you go on for the master's there? No, I did not do a master's there. Uh, actually, at Georgia Tech, it was called a BEE, a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering. I don't know why the S was missing, but anyway, uh, it was a BEE from, from Georgia Tech. Did you work at WAGA TV? as an intern or a student at the same time that you're going to school? I worked as a part-time technician, student technician, while I was in school. So, I, of course, I didn't uh, attend school uh, all year round. It was on a quarter system, so I was usually off in the summer. So I worked pretty much full-time for WAGA in the summer, but I worked nights and weekends for them while I was uh, in school. And that was quite an interesting job because... I uh, not only worked as a cameraman and met some very interesting people, including uh, two presidents along the way, but it was also very educational because that particular station designed and built a lot of their own equipment. So when we were not actually working as cameramen or working as uh, video or audio operators, we were back in the shop building equipment from scratch. They had a brilliant chief engineer who designed and uh, had us build a lot of equipment, including video distribution amplifiers, video switchers, audio switchers, and so on. Why was that cheaper than, say, going to any of the companies that were making equipment in those days, RCA, places like that? Well, they, they weren't really, they had co-op programs, but they, you know, getting a job with one of those companies would probably be uh, an alternate quarter thing. So, uh, it wouldn't fit the schedule as well as what I did. I went to school three quarters and I worked one quarter in summers and I had a particular interest in, in broadcast. Why did this chief engineer at WAGA think that building the stuff in-house was more cost effective than buying it from out of house unless the labor was really cheap? Well, I think uh, it was a combination of things. We were we were there anyway as technicians, so in our downtime, they got some productivity out of us. But more importantly, the engineer that designed this equipment really had a futuristic vision, and we were building things that you could not buy on the market. For instance, the audio uh, mixing equipment and switching equipment at that station was all remote. The control surfaces that the the operators used were remote from the actual racks where the audio mixing and amplification and distribution was done. So there were there were features in in the the equipment that we built that really weren't available uh, commercially at that time. So things like you know AC hum, all these issues that you might have with lots of cables going in and out of the control surface were eliminated by remotely controlling it, keeping them short, keeping them in the cabinet. Yes, exactly. And it was kind of the precursor to where we are today. Today, uh, almost all the audio and video in any broadcast facility is all uh, transported over internet protocol now. Uh, so there's hardly any uh, analog audio or analog video running around. But in those days, uh, it was still analog, but it was analog that could be carefully controlled and contained uh, in one area. Now, it's my understanding from a little research that you actually created a FM broadcast transmitter while you were at Georgia Tech? Yes, that's right. I was uh, one of the founders of the uh, Georgia Tech student FM station. The call letters are W-R-E-K, REC, 
uh, to go with the rambling wreck uh, mascot of uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, that station uh, was first licensed in 1968 as a 10 watt station. Uh, we went on the air with a uh, commercial uh, educational package from Gates Radio and a, um, an antenna, a two element <laughs> FM antenna that was donated by WTOP in Washington. It was something that they had used in the past. But we were eager to get more coverage and more power than 10 watts. And again, had a very limited budget. We were totally funded by student activities fees. So we really didn't have any um, you know, state money flowing into the station. So I decided to build a 450 watt amplifier. Why that size? Well, I had a, a 4CX 300Y ceramic tetrode tube that was uh, a pull from uh, another station I worked for in Johnstown, WJAC-TV, uh, and uh, they would periodically replace uh, tubes in their TV transmitter uh, before they failed. And so I had this, uh, I had this uh, free 4CX300Y, and I thought, well, that'll be a good tube for about 450 watts. So I wound up designing and building a 450 watt transmitter using that tube and um, some surplus parts uh, that we bought from a guy named Julian. Let's see, I'm trying to think what Julian's last name was, but he was an Eastern Airlines pilot uh, who had a hobby electronics business on the side and, and it was in a suburban uh, location near Atlanta. He had this warehouse that was full of all kinds of uh, military surplus electronics. And uh, we went there and we bought vacuum capacitors and a plate transformer and uh, rectifiers and meters and filter chokes and you name it. And so we collected these uh, surplus parts together and uh, built this transmitter. I, uh, I didn't even have a workbench. <laughs> if you go look at the link to the uh, WREK transmitter that's on my uh, QRZ page for WHGNM. You'll find a link there and it'll take you to uh, the history of that transmitter. I literally built that thing with a uh, hacksaw and uh, pliers and a uh, file and a nibbling tool. On the floor, as I recall. I found the article. Yeah, you were building it on the floor. Yeah, yeah, building it on the floor, but that's what we did. <laughs> so anyway, it actually worked quite well. We used that transmitter for, it, it, first of all, that transmitter Combined with another uh, cast off antenna, we wound up getting an eight bay FM antenna from WKLS FM. It had been hit by lightning and replaced. And uh, we rebuilt that antenna, retuned it to 91.1, which is WREK's frequency. That antenna had uh, you know, more power gain than the two element, the original Andrew antenna. So with a combination of the 450 watt amplifier and the eight bay antenna got us to uh, 3.2 kilowatts effective radiated power and uh, greatly expanded our signal by the way wrek is still on the air today i just a couple years ago attended the uh, 50th reunion of wrek uh, staff and uh, the station is currently a hundred thousand watts uh, which is one of the very few student owned and operated stations of that caliber in the country well, it seems to me that you had this amazing confluence of Georgia Tech, WAGA, this opportunity with WREK that kind of maybe set the tone for your career. Yes, it's, it, it certainly did. Before we leave Georgia Tech, I want to also mention that I was active at W4AQL. They still uh, have that call sign there, the Georgia Tech Amer Amateur Radio Station. And I uh, had a lot of fun making modifications, improvements to their old BC610 uh, transmitter. I decided that I wanted to go into some type of communications uh, engineering, preferably broadcast engineering. But when I graduated in 1970, the broadcast equipment industry was in a bit of a slump. And uh, I remember sending out resumes and nobody was uh, hiring in the broadcast realm. So I, I wound up going to work for Comco, which uh, was a division of EF Johnson. Comco was located in Coral Gables, Florida. And so my first job out of uh, Georgia Tech was designing aviation, land mobile, and marine communications for Comco. And that was in 1970. If we're thinking back to those days, 
is there a specific radio that you have a fond remembrance of? Well, you know, we worked on a, a lot of different transceivers. Uh, one that was particularly interesting was uh, a, a receiver for the aviation band for ground-based communications to aircraft. And that receiver had very, very uh, stringent intermodulation specifications. This was in the early days of um, MOS FETs. And uh, I remember learning about dual gate MOSFETs, uh, using them as um, highly linear um, antenna preamplifiers and the mixers. Um, so that was quite an interesting project to work on uh, because we had to build some special test equipment to even measure the performance of the receivers. But another, another project we did at Comco, which was a lot of fun, was we were uh, hired by national airlines to design their ground communications equipment between the uh, what they call the tug or the tractor that moves a 747 and the uh, crew on the 747. Uh, this was, you know, a new airplane at that time. National Airlines was based in, in Miami. So uh, we designed this uh, intercom system uh, for the 747. And when they had their first inaugural flights of the 747, National Airlines threw a big party uh, on a 747, they invited uh, a lot of their suppliers as well as travel agents and others to this inaugural flight. So we all got on this 747 and took off and uh, flew at relatively low altitude up and down the coast of Florida. And uh, it was a big cocktail party. They actually had a baby grand piano up on the upper level of this 747 with the guy playing piano at the bar. So that was uh, quite a memorable experience. How did your career proceed after that? Well, I still had broadcasting in my blood, and I was always thinking about, you know, technology that I was working on at Comco or later at a company called Wackenhut Protective Systems. Uh, that was my second job in Florida, and we were doing uh, electronic security systems. Uh, but as I was working on these things, I was always thinking about, boy, this would make a really good stereo generator. Or, you know, I was always thinking about applications for the technology that I was learning about in the broadcast realm. So in 1973, I decided I was going to take a, another shot at a job in the broadcast industry. So I sent out some resumes and, um, I wound up getting interviews uh, from three companies. One was uh, American Electronics Labs, AEL. They were in the Philadelphia area and built some broadcast equipment. RCA, their broadcast division, which was in Meadowlands, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh, and Gates Radio, which was then part of uh, Harris Corporation in Quincy, Illinois. And so I did wind up uh, getting interviews from all of those companies, but I was particularly impressed by the young group of engineers at Gates. And, uh, you know, in the end, I got an offer from RCA and from Gates, and the G Gates offer wasn't as good as, it wasn't as big as the art offer from RCA, but I decided I wanted to go somewhere where I could learn more. And I took the job with Gates Radio and never regretted it, never looked back. Um, the guy that hired me was a, a great mentor and, um, I was uh, surrounded by people who were smarter than me and were eager to share and teach me. Now, Gates Radio, I'm not a broadcaster or have any connections to broadcasting, but as I understand it, Gates Radio was a supplier to many radio stations, maybe even TV stations. Did they have TV transmitters too? Yes. Uh, Gates Radio uh, actually started out as an audio equipment company and formed by the Gates family. And... Um, Parker Gates, the son who carried on the business, moved into radio in the in the forties. Post war, they became uh, a major supplier of AM and FM transmitters to uh, radio stations all over the world. And then, when Harris Intertype, at that time it was called Harris Intertype Corporation, acquired them in 1968, they moved into the television market, and um, they. Um, came up with a very innovative television transmitter. It was the first analog TV transmitter that used what's called IF modulation, and we're quite successful uh, with that. So 
the company then became a major supplier of both radio and television transmitting equipment, as well as studio equipment to, um, uh, you know, U.S. and uh, overseas stations. They, they built shortwave transmitters up to several hundred kilowatts. And then uh, later, uh, a lot of innovations came from a guy named Hilmer Swanson, who uh, was the inventor of basically all of the modern AM modulation techniques, things like pulse duration modulation, pulse step modulation, and uh, eventually a complete digital modulation scheme called DX. So I had the good fortune to work with Hilmer and worked as a design engineer and then eventually ran the radio uh, business unit. And then later when we branched out into digital television, I wound up being the vice president of engineering for all of the radio and television equipment development. Let me ask, is Gates still around? Are they still making digital transmitters or transmitters? Well, Gates uh, Radio uh, became the Harris Broadcast Division. And then in 2013, uh, Harris Corporation decided to become a pure play defense electronics company. So they sold the uh, Gates, the Harris or Gates Broadcast Division to a venture capital company and they went back to the uh, incorporate the name Gates in the name of the company. So it is now called Gates Air. So Gates Air is still based in Quincy, Illinois. Their engineering and uh, senior management product development is in suburban Cincinnati, but their manufacturing is still in Quincy. And they're doing quite well. They've been one of the major suppliers for uh, digital television transmitters during the uh, Spectrum Repack. Uh, activities the last couple of years where uh, some uh, TV broadcasters sold their spectrum to uh, the wireless providers, primarily uh, T-Mobile. And uh, many of those, the transmitters that remained on the air had to be uh, changed in frequency or replaced. And so uh, that was a, a benefit to Gates Air. And do you see as a person that has now retired from the industry, but as still a consultant to the industry, do you see that over-the-air transmitters for broadcast will continue to be in demand? Or do you think that we'll kind of fold up the tent and send everything over the internet? No, I think it's, I think uh, over-the-air broadcast is still quite viable for the long term, both in the U.S. and in Europe and other countries for a, a number of reasons. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we're, we're currently using um, what's called ATSC, um, Advanced Television Systems Committee, version one, uh, which is uh, what's called an 8VSB digital TV signal. It has a payload of about 19.8 megabits per second. But there is a new system that's been developed called ATSC 3.0. It's actually being tested on the air in a number of markets right now that has uh, about double that capacity. Plus it has a, um, uh, a better modulation technique called OFDM that is uh, particularly good for mobile reception. So where, why, why does this make broadcast uh, viable? Well, first of all, it allows the broadcasters to provide mobile uh, signals. If you think about IP or internet uh, broadcasting, whether it's over, um, wired link fiber or over the air with 4G, 5G, it's still uh, somewhat limited to where the uh, 5G footprint is. Uh, the broadcasters have, you know, a huge stick. I call it the big stick with megawatts. So they have tremendous coverage over rural areas that would likely never be served well by uh, a cellular approach to broadcasting. And when there's a um, you know, a major uh, catastrophe, a storm, a hurricane, or something else, you'll find that most of the wireless systems and internet systems go down because they're, they're um, networked in such a way that there's a lot of places where there can be a single point failure. They don't have adequate power backup. But most of the broadcasters have completely redundant sites, and they have their own backup generator power. So you know, when all else fails, people turn on their AM radio or their or their DTV. Uh, there, that is an issue because there's not very many battery-powered DTVs around. But hopefully, 
uh, they can use their mobile uh, phones uh, to receive ATSC 3.0. There's also uh, new business models for the TV broadcasters uh, besides providing um, news and information, uh, entertainment content. They can, uh, they can sell a part of their payload, their digital payload for other applications. Like electronic signs or advertising or something like that. Yes, it could be, uh, it can be uh, hyper location uh, advertising down to uh, one particular point uh, in a city or, you know, all kinds of other applications. So, and, and that's even true of some of the older technologies like HF shortwave broadcasting, which is largely faded. There's still uh, some work going on with a, a digital system called DRM for uh, HF broadcasting, but a lot of broadcasters, including uh, our own VOA, U.S. Information Agency, if uh, move to internet distribution. But guess what? You know, depending on what happens with world events and politics, uh, the internet can be shut down anywhere by any government at any time. And so, you know, a lot of people think it's a good idea to have a direct over the air method to get news and information to people. So I'm hearing you talk, and I know that perhaps our generation, and maybe a generation before us, although certainly I can't think of my children's generation, actually own broadcast radios. So I guess I'm asking the question, do you see that perhaps smartphones might actually have the ability to receive these off-air signals? Or are we creating these broadcast opportunities where the younger generation just doesn't have the radios? Well, as a matter of fact, many uh, smartphones today do include uh, chips for FM broadcast but they're disabled by a lot of the wire, wireless carriers because they don't contribute to the wireless carrier's revenue stream directly. So there's, it's not a technological issue, it's a, it's a business model issue. So the answer is that mobile devices can receive radio and television, especially you know in the UHF frequency band, which is kind of like beachfront property spectrum-wise, uh, that's why all the wireless carriers were after some of that UHF spectrum. So there's no reason why uh, broadcast services can't be carried uh, and delivered by what we think of as a smartphone today. So there is an opportunity for creating, you know, you think about it, there seems to be no end to natural disasters around the world. In North America, it seems especially maybe because they have the largest news gathering to be able to report it that all these infrastructures that we use for our smartphones are so fragile that when they're gone, you know, we're kind of left holding a phone that doesn't work. So just knowing that perhaps it could be configured to receive an off-air signal or emergency signal or an update from the local broadcaster is actually kind of comforting. You're absolutely right. So there, there's no reason that that mobile device, as I said, many of them in the hands of people today can receive over-the-air broadcast radio and television uh, it's just a matter of a software switch <laughs> being thrown in the phone. The hardware is already there. And so there are some broadcasters that are, are trying to find ways to have cooperative business models with the wireless carriers. I mean, a lot of these phones are, are supplied by wireless carriers, unless you buy an unlocked phone. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of them are, are you, you get them from whatever carrier and they have their own software. And they have their own business model, so they exclude other things. We'll see how that evolves in time. What's significant to you about WLW in Cincinnati, Ohio? Well, WLW was a, a great technological achievement back in the, the 1930s. At one time, it was the most powerful AM broadcast station in the world. It was uh, 500,000 watts, half a million watts operated from north side of uh, Cincinnati uh, near Mason, Ohio, and had a very unique uh, state-of-the-art tower at that time. It was um, one of the early vertically polarized uh, antenna systems, and it is a 750-foot um, uh, roughly high antenna built by Blau Knox in Pittsburgh in, in, at that era, and that was uh, revolutionary at the time. I had the uh, good fortune to live and work just a few miles from that tower. And so I had the opportunity to visit that transmitter site many times. And 
the old 500 kilowatt transmitter is still there in the building. It's no longer operational, but most of the parts are still there. Now, were you active in amateur radio through this entire period of time of your career? Yes, sometimes more active than others. When I was living in Florida working for Comco, I was apartment dweller, so I really didn't have an outdoor antenna. So I did a little bit of mobile amateur radio. So depending upon where I lived over my career and how busy I was raising a family, et cetera, uh, that determined how, how much time I got to spend with amateur radio. But I did stay uh, engaged over the years. I, um, <clears throat> I had my K3VLN call until um, 1973 uh, when I moved to uh, Quincy, Illinois to go to work for Gates Radio. At that time, I got W9NEZ, and I had that call sign until 2000. After I moved to Cincinnati with Harris Gates, I got a W8 call. So my current call, W8GNM, I've had um, since uh, 2000. And along the way, I also had an international call. I had a Caymanian call, uh, ZF2CQ, which was a uh, call sign I used when I was in the Cayman Islands. I uh, I'm also a scuba diver and underwater photographer, and my wife and I used to spend quite a bit of time in the uh, Cayman Islands. I would also operate amateur radio there, just throwing up a dipole in the palm trees and, and operating from the Cayman Islands as ZF2CQ. What is your favorite operating mode when you were operating down there in the Cayman Islands? Primarily single sideband. Did some CW, but I could generate bigger pileups on sideband. Uh, and I enjoyed being on the other side of those pileups. Because you were at Rare DX down there. Well, rare to some people. <laughs> yeah. In my setting up this interview with you, I came across an article where you're standing with Art Collins, W0CXX, who was the founder of Collins Radio. I thought that was a really cool picture. But I also wanted to know, what was the circumstance that led you to be in Art's presence? And how did that go? Well, at the time, I was working for another broadcast company. When I, while I was in Quincy, I worked for Gates Radio for a number of years. And then I went to a, another company called Broadcast Electronics, which was founded by Larry Cervone. He was former general manager at, at Gates Harris. And we had developed a, a new 30-kilowatt FM transmitter that had a unique output uh, stage configuration called a folded half-wave cavity. And I had... Um, I had known Warren Bruni, who was one of Art's close associates. We, Warren and I wrote one of the chapters for the uh, National Association of Broadcasters Engineering Handbook together. And Warren was and Art were quite interested in this folded half-wave cavity. So that photo was taken uh, at the NAB show in Dallas, uh, Texas, I believe. And that was taken at the Broadcast Electronics booth. And uh, I gave Art a tour of that cavity and explained how it worked. And uh, he was quite interested in, in uh, how the whole thing worked. Now, was Collins making broadcast radios or broadcast transmitters in those days? Yes, they were. Uh, they had a uh, division that made uh, both AM and FM transmitters. Originally, it started out in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, but then it uh, wound up in, uh, in the Dallas area. Eventually, uh, uh, was acquired by uh, Continental Electronics, another company in the Dallas area. What's the current rig? Which current rig? <laughs> Before we turned off the video at the very beginning of our conversation on Zoom, which is what we're using now, I was actually looking at the array of equipment that was behind you. And so I guess those are the current rigs. But when I think of a rig, I think of the whole operating position, not just a single radio. So what are the radios that defined your current rig? Well, my current ham radio station, primary uh, transceiver is a Flex uh, 6600M. It's the Flex 6600M means it has a front panel. I still prefer radios with knobs on the front panel, although it can be operated with a computer-based GUI. So that's the main transceiver. I also recently got a Flex PGXL LDMOS Legal Limit Amplifier. Only had that a short time. I have a, an amplifier that I built along the way and improved along the way over the years with bits and pieces uh, from the broadcast industry. It uh, uses a pair of 3500Z 
uh, zero bias triodes. So it's a legal limit amplifier. And um, I also, my previous solid state amplifier is a Tokyo High Power HL 1.5 KFX. I have um, a dedicated ham radio computer that I run Windows 10 on, and I have a uh, display in front of me that I can do my logging with, and I can also uh, use digital modes like FT8. The audio uh, lineup in my station is my um, studio mic is a, a Heil PR40 microphone. I have a, a pair of Symmetrix 528E uh, microphone preamplifiers. They also have uh, noise gates and equalization capability. And I have one of those for the PR40, and I have one of them for my headset, which is a Heil ProSet Plus uh, with a boom mic. And those feed into an Orban Optimod AM audio processor, which is a broadcast audio processor that I was fortunate to get in an employee sale <laughs> of old uh, show equipment. But it's uh, quite ama an amazing uh, device. And then that Optimod feeds the, directly feeds the input of my Flex 6600M. And my backup radio is an ICOM uh, 756 Pro 2. And boy, I, I worked a lot of DX with that 756 Pro 2 as well. So that's pretty much the collection of equipment I have in the racks. I, I also have a, a Harris MS-15 FM exciter in the rack, which is uh, not hooked up to anything right now. It's just kind of being stored there, but it's, it's kind of a trophy. It's one of the FM exciters that I was involved in designing over the years. This particular one spent 10 or 15 years at WREK in Atlanta before they upgraded to HD radio. So they gave their old exciter to me. And so I have finally have one of the exciters I worked on in my rack. So Jeff, I'm a little surprised that a guy like you wouldn't have a AM broadcast transmitter in the shack there to talk on AM, like on 80 meters or 160. Well, you know, I've thought about that over the years and I've worked on some with some other friends be nice to have a, <laughs> a Gates BC-1T or something like that. but The beautiful triodes in the window. Yeah, the, the 833s glowing or whatever. Yeah, I know. Well, those are, those are neat to have, but there's space limitations. There's XYL limitations. Actually, we just finished our annual AM night on the um, Greater Cincinnati Amateur Radio Association's 1936 net. Uh, that was this past Thursday. It's the last Thursday in December. And we have a lot of heavy metal checking in there, a lot of broadcast rigs. But you know what? It's not as efficient, but I can generate just as beautiful an AM signal with a Flex 6600 <laughs> driving a legal limit uh, MOSFET amplifier. Uh, and the guy on the other end couldn't tell whether I was running a, a Gates or a Collins transmitter or a... Um, a linear amplifier. Not as efficient, but uh, you can generate excellent AM that way as well. So I don't get on AM much anymore. So the combination of the PR40, the Optimod broadcast processor and all that stuff going into the Flex 6600 makes you sound like your broadcast quality. Absolutely. And, you know, you can open up the bandwidth on the Flex to uh, 10 kilohertz if you want to, we typically annoy people enough with uh, four kilohertz, <laughs> plus or minus four kilohertz bandwidth on AM. But yes, you can you can actually sound as as good as a broadcast rig with a flex, or for that matter, another uh, software defined radio like the Anon uh, radios uh, that are capable of going full bandwidth. What's the current QTH? Uh, my current. Current QTH is, uh, I live on an island off the north coast of Ohio, uh, but it's an island you can drive to year round, so you don't have to take a ferry to get here. It's called Catawba Island, which is uh, the name of a grape that they grow around here. And it's the first island in an archipelago that extends uh, north into the western basin of uh, Lake Erie. So you're surrounded by water. You're on an island. Do you operate Maritime Mobile? Uh, occasionally I do. I, I have a sailboat and I have an ICOM uh, 706 that I can use in the car and I have operated from my sailboat. What do you load up the backstay? No, um, I've tried that, but it's always difficult to get a, uh, a good ground system um, that way. Uh, actually, 
<laughs> the best uh, the best performance is to hoist a dipole like an inverted V up the mast. But I've also on the higher bands I've used a um, hamstick type antenna off the uh, railing in the back using the the lifelines and the railing as counterpoint. And that seems to work just fine while your wife takes the helm. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Now it's my understanding that your wife is also a ham. She is. She's not real active now. Uh, we used to uh, be very active as hams when uh, we lived in Quincy and before cell phones were popular. Uh, we had two meter rigs in our cars and we had a local repeater. So we, uh, we would keep track of each other on two meters that way. You have a ham radio workbench? I do. What's the most interesting piece of test equipment that you have on your ham radio workbench? Oh, boy. I have a lot of old HP boat anchors. I have a, a network analyzer and a spectrum analyzer. I have RF voltmeters. I have a couple of different scopes. Uh, I recently got a digital scope. It's a hand tech. I'm amazing. <laughs> scope, 300 bucks. It's a one giga sample digital scope. That's quite interesting, but I have some old Tektronix uh, equipment as well. You have the capability, even with all that old gear, to do some really serious testing. Now, you mentioned to me earlier that you were actually making an evaluation of the new Flex amplifier. What kind of evaluation are you making? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of interested in uh, the intermodulation performance of uh, that amplifier, which uh, should be better uh, than the average uh, MOSFET amplifier. Most of the... Um, uh, solid state amplifiers, um, their uh, third order or fifth order IMD distortion isn't uh, as good as a vacuum tube amplifier like a 3500Z or a 3CX1500 type amplifier. Um, the MOSFETs uh, are just not quite as linear, but uh, the Flex amplifier has some interesting features. They have um, adaptive biasing of the FETs depending on the operating mode. And they have a, an interesting uh, harmonic uh, filtering system that actually uh, splits off the harmonics into a resistive load rather than reflect them back, reflecting them back into, directly to the amplifier. So uh, I'm kind of interested to see uh, how much that Im improves the uh, performance. Are you a DX chaser or contester? I participate in quite a few contests, just more or less to give points to other people. I'm not a guy that's really hardcore trying to win. A couple times I've, I've had some pretty good scores that even surprised myself, but uh, I'm there primarily to give points to other contesters that are really uh, serious. I am a fairly serious DXer and I have a uh, nine band DXCC. So I'm at about 296 countries right now. Don't know if I'll ever get much past 300. The last 20 or 30 are really hard to get. But I did work the Monk SV2RSG stroke A on Mount Athos, which is a pretty difficult one to get. Uh, he's been on recently, so um, we keep working on it. You were a presenter at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo last August, and you presented compromised beverage antennas here better than you think. It was a very interesting presentation that you made, and the Q&A that came afterwards was also very interesting, and that can still be viewed on our Vimeo channel. What is the current interest, the current amateur radio interest that you're doing? Well, I'm still, you know, very interested in design, computer modeling, and optimization uh, construction of amateur radio antennas. Those are still things you can get your hands around and work with <laughs> compared to uh, a lot of the surface mount stuff that's a little difficult to work with on the equipment. I'm still involved in further improving and supporting the BevFlex 4X uh, antenna system that I developed a few years ago, which can be a beverage uh, bog, uh, EWE, or a flag antenna. It's a low noise receive antenna. So I continue to uh, do some work with W9XT on uh, making further improvements to that and helping people who are working, uh, you know, building their first beverage uh, or bog antenna and um, how to get it working and optimized. I um, still I'm in, I'm very interested in SDR radio technology. So haven't built much of that from scratch, but very interested in um, learning about SDR and the applications of it. And uh, as I said earlier, still interested in the design of RF power amplifiers and other homebrew projects. Um, 
you know, I recently built some antenna switching equipment. And, um, oh, I might add, uh, I have both a Nano VNA and a Tiny SA. And those are two wonderful little pieces of test equipment that are very inexpensive that every ham should have. And uh, I've been um, learning a lot using them uh, instead of my big boat anchor equipment. Uh, use a nano VNA a lot to uh, measure and optimize uh, antennas. For instance, my hex beam, I recently uh, came up with a slight modification to the feed system on it, which has improved the uh, SWR across all six bands. So that sounds like that should be an article for a magazine, given the number of people that have hex beam antennas. Yeah, I guess I could do that. I have a couple of articles and kind of I've kicked around uh, maybe uh, submitting to QST. Or it could even be another presentation at the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. Yeah, yeah, it could be. What do you think the greatest challenge is facing amateur radio now? Well, there's a couple uh, that I can think of. First is getting the next generation of young people interested in amateur radio. It's like, well, why would we want to do amateur radio when we can get on the internet and text uh, or FaceTime anywhere in the world? But there's a certain magic still, to me at least, in amateur radio, being able to send uh, signals directly from one point on the earth to another without any intervening uh, technologies or delays or um, censorship or anything like that. So I think the digital modes like FT8 and other digital modes uh, can be attractive to younger people that are um, are very interested in those technologies and maybe makes uh, amateur radio more relevant to them. There are some controversies um, about FT8. I, I think it's been a blessing for l the low sunspot cycle, especially for people with limited antennas and um, limited power QRP. But it can be too automated and abused by those who are in search of a quick DXCC award. I hear of people running multiple, uh, you know, FT8 streams and uh, trying to just, it's like uh, uh, drinking from a fire hose. How much, how much uh, DX can you work? In fact, I even run into some of those people who call me on FT8 while I'm calling somebody else. And I get around to finishing my QSL. I call them back. They're already gone somewhere else. There's a great migration away from single sideband and CW modes to digital modes. That uh, has its good sides and its bad sides as well. Migration to digital modes is, has uh, thinned out the opportunities on uh, sideband and, and CW, but I think each of those modes has its place and, and it will reach equilibrium at some point. Do you have a sense how you might attract the next generation into ham radio? Have you thought about what tactical things we could do on the ground to actually create interest from that generation? Well, I think getting involved with uh, STEM programs at the high school level is, uh, is a great way to get people interested. A lot of young people don't have any idea of what, that even ham radio exists. And, you know, when you talk to them about, about it or bring them over to your, to your shack and show it to them, um, they sometimes get pretty excited uh, about, wow, you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world from your, you know, on a piece of wire in your backyard. That's pretty cool. So I think um, keeping it relevant, I think the, um, the opportunities to talk to uh, the space station and uh, astronauts, I mean, that's been, that opportunity has been around for a long time. I remember uh, going to my daughter's grade school and getting them, uh, uh, in contact with a space shuttle. And so um, that's a way to capture the imaginations of young people. And a lot of young people are, are, are interested in uh, building things with um, computers uh, like the Arduino stuff. And tying that in with amateur radio is a, is a good way to keep them interested. Do you think that when you see a demonstration, for example, of talking to the space shuttle, that there's also a pitch for amateur radio and even maybe the local amateur radio club or something like that to students or a follow-up activity that could kind of rope them in while it's still percolating in their brain. Does that happen? I think so. Uh, I think, again, especially in, in high school, the STEM programs and, you know, amateur radio offers a lot of opportunities for people to do science fair projects combined with a hobby. 
it's not as popular in high school as a lot of other activities, but I think that there's still a way to promote that. Well, you're giving me an idea. It seems to me that local amateur radio clubs could kind of keep their eye out on what the science fair program is in their community and actually come up with perhaps even a resource list of potential science fair projects that would be new and different to many students. Yes. Let's see. I'm trying to remember her name, but uh, you will know. The uh, the young lady who uh, did the Around the World Balloon Project, there's an example of, of someone who combined amateur radio uh, with uh, science, technology, and math and put together a project where they, uh, they flew a balloon uh, that was designed to go to a particular altitude and not, and not uh, explode, <laughs> come back down. And it made it all around, around the world uh, several times and they were able to track it uh, via amateur radio and GPS reporting. So that was uh, quite an accomplishment. What excites you the most about amateur radio right now? Well, <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's just one thing. On the one hand, I enjoy chasing after those last couple of countries to have them all for DX. Well, as I said, I already have nine band DXCC, but there's still quite a few that I haven't worked. That's kind of exciting when one of them appears and I can chase after it. I have a couple of regular groups that I get together with to just rag chew. One of them is a group of broadcast engineers, and uh, we get together once a week and um, uh, have a good old time. and. Um, you know, usually chat for an hour and an hour and a half. So I enjoy that. We have this uh, 1936 uh, net every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Everybody's welcome to check in around the country. And um, our annual AM night, uh, that one night a year, the last uh, Thursday in December, is a lot of fun with the, uh, the AM rigs checking in. Yeah, I enjoy tinkering and measuring, building, measuring, and optimizing things. What advice would you give to newer returning hams? I think if somebody's returning to ham radio after you know leaving in the totally analog world, they ought to investigate uh, some of the new operating modes, some of the digital modes, and learn about them. Do you think ham radio clubs still play a part in welcoming new and returning hams back into the hobby? Or has it been replaced, do you think, by the internet and by Facebook groups and things like that? Well, I think I think uh, in some area, in some locations, the amateur radio clubs are quite active and do welcome and attract hams back into the hobby. Not so much in this area, but I'm in a little bit more of a remote area. Although I have reached out to a couple of the clubs, and um, I have gone out to uh, you know see their field day operations and so forth. But back to your question about what do I recommend for somebody coming uh, back into the hobby? Well, I, I think they uh, need to investigate the newer operating modes. They certainly need to learn about uh, software-defined radio technology. That's all new. And uh, depending upon where they're living now, when they come back into the hobby, they may have some challenges in terms of what, how much space they have for antennas and things. Well, that's, that can be uh, a whole new thing to figure out how can you build an efficient antenna in the uh, space that you have. If you have a lot of space, you can have some really big projects, but even if you have limited space, you can try some new things. Antennas are always uh, uh, an important part of amateur radio, and it's pr probably one of the most important parts of the station. I think that we forget that any kind of antenna is better than no antenna. An HOA perhaps can represent either a big downer for amateur radio or your cup is half full and it's a big opportunity to figure out how to make it work and your neighbors not see it. Well, I had a recent experience uh, with a friend um, in an HOA situation uh, that put a pl flagpole antenna in and uh, he, was, he was allowed to have a flagpole and uh, it looked like a flagpole. It was a flagpole. It just happened to be insulated from the ground. We had quite an interesting time uh, optimizing that, uh, putting a, a remote antenna tuner uh, in a weatherproof box hidden in the shrubbery at the bottom of the of the pole and um, optimizing it and uh, putting in the, the radials and hiding those. And so everybody was happy. Uh, everybody thought he had a nice flagpole and he worked a lot of DX with it.
I always think when people are doing this, especially, you know, where there's like large grassy areas and no fences between properties in some of these places where someone does this, there doesn't seem to be any activity or questions during the construction. Yeah. Well, it depends on, you know, if you're putting radials in, um, your neighbor might uh, ask some questions, but if you put them in when your neighbor's not around, if it's a, a situation where it's seasonal and it's a summer home, or at least your neighbor's a summer home, you can generally get these things done without raising uh, too, many, uh, too many eyebrows. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. You have a very interesting history, and I think anybody that has an interest in broadcast will recognize all of the companies that you used to work for and made major contributions to. And I want to thank you again for sharing that story with me on QSO Today. Okay, Eric. Well, it's been my pleasure to talk with you today. You're, you're a very good interviewer and uh, glad to have the opportunity to uh, tell a little bit of my story. And uh, I hope to, to work some of your listeners on the air as well. So we'll be listening for them. Thank you so much. 73. 73, Eric. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Jeff. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in W8GNM in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates on the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. I am updating it as I have more information. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric, 4 z one ug 73. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with, on towers, on the roof, or on the ground. Waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, 4-ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, 
This stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces. But again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about five minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen one, this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. The problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat, and more. It tends to start to unwrap over time, crack, or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available, so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency, and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Imagine a transistor that uses sound waves. Researchers have done more than imagine it. They've created it. They're called acoustic topological transistors, and unlike devices presently in use, they operate using sound waves, not electrons. Researchers say that one of the transistor's key assets is its ability to function with almost no dissipation of energy. The electrons are designed to flow with no resistance. According to a January 19th post in the IEEE Spectrum website, the creation of these transistors was made possible with the use of acoustical topological insulators. This follows the development in 2007 of something related, electronic topological insulators. These insulators protect electrons flow from any disturbances. Oxford University researcher Harris Peary said the development of these newest transistors will find applications in such field as one-way acoustic propagation, ultrasound imaging, acoustic noise reduction, echolocation, acoustic cloaking and acoustic communications. He said that because of the physics of sound waves and the physics of light waves are so alike, the same design principles that scientists use for creating acoustical topological transistors would be useful as well for similar devices using light. And finally this week, from August 5th, 1994 through December 20th, 2021, a span of nearly 10,000 days, AWRL member John Shannon, K3WWP of Catanning, Pennsylvania, made at least one CW contact while running 5 watts or less to simple wire antennas. That includes one that's in his attic. With more details on this new record of sorts, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, with the details. Over the course of those 10,000 days, Shannon made 72,190 contacts with 20,098 unique stations. For at least 2,099 of his contacts, his signal traveled 1,000 miles or more per watt. Another 24,098 were DX contacts made with 224 DXCC entities. He contacted all 50 states many times over. 
He made 3,819 contacts with stations in Pennsylvania and 63 contacts with stations in Wyoming. The DX country he contacted most often was Germany with 1,934 contacts. He said his streak is not over. He intends to continue making daily contacts for 11,000 or 12,000 days. View his website for more information, www.k3wwp.com. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. By continent, his contact totals ranged from 52,639 with stations in North America to 325 with stations in Oceania, plus 18 with stations in Antarctica. The number of contacts he made on each band used includes 19,279 on 40 meters, 15,459 on 20 meters, 28 on 60 meters, and 39 on 6 meters. Within his first UTC hour of operation each day, Shannon logged nearly 73% of his daily contacts. He also experienced a DX streak from March 1, 2013 through August 1, 2018, which was a total of 1,980 days. During this time, he contacted at least one DX station per day. Shannon said that the greatest satisfaction he's derived from his operating streak is that other hams expressed that he inspired their interest in and enjoyment of CW and QRP operating, and that they really enjoyed it. In the early 2000s, he wrote for the QRP with John Shannon K3WWP column in the Keynote, the Fists CW Club's newsletter. Additionally, his article, The Streak, 23 Years of Daily Contacts, was published in the August 2017 issue of QST. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter. The Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters. The Amateur Radio Newsline, The Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, The International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service, at our website at TWIAR.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio.